afternoon and thank you all for joining us today on our Facebook Live webinar. Today we're going to be talking about um, some really important topics concerning it, um, reporting child abuse, so mandatory reporting of child abuse. So today we have Eli Molina and Mike Sloan with us here. I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves and then we're going to get kicked off with some questions. Thanks, Amy. And you need to introduce yourself as well. Well, I'm my Amy. Name is, yeah. Yep. Go ahead. I'm you Amy go Steer. First. I forgot to mention that I'm Amy Steer and I'm the director of programs for Grace. So today I'm just going to be here and I'm going to be um, asking some questions of our experts. Awesome. Glad to be with you all today. My name is Mike Sloan. I'm the director of safeguarding at Grace. And of course, Grace stands for Godly Response to Abuse in the Christian Environment. Uh, since 2004, we've helped hundreds of churches with our mission, which is to empower those churches to understand, prevent, and respond to abuse. Uh, my background is actually as a pastor. So for nine and a half years, I served in two different churches as a local pastor. And for the last few years, I've worked full-time for Grace. And in our safeguarding initiative, we work directly with churches, providing uh, deeper training on protecting vulnerable of course, we focus on child abuse, but other forms of abuse as well. And then, of course, we help them develop uh, policy and think through all sorts of safety issues related to protecting the vulnerable. So glad to be with you all today as we talk about some very important questions regarding reporting child abuse. And I'm Eli Molina. I am currently the Forensic Interviewer Supervisor at the Children's Advocacy Center of Collin County. And I have been a Forensic Interviewer for six years now. I started there at the Advocacy Center as a community resource caseworker. And I really just fell in love with our mission of safety, justice, and healing. And I fell in love with the impact that we had as a community to be able to help children who had been victims of abuse. At our um, advocacy center itself, we do global interviews, which that means we interview children who have been victimized of any type of abuse, whether it be physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglectful supervision, drug endangerment, and sex trafficking. And so my background is in psychology, and I'm so happy to be here for uh, this great event. And which Thank Collin you. County, Eli? Tell, tell us where Collin County Collin County is near Plano, and so that's in Texas. A fellow Texan. I'm from Texas. About 30, 30, 35 minutes away from downtown Dallas. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, both of you. Um, just going to jump right in and ask some questions. So our first question is going to be for Mike. Um, in thinking about situations where we as individuals might need to report child abuse, most of us have heard the term mandated reporter. What does that mean and how do we know if we're, we are a mandated reporter? Right, that's a great question. So a mandated reporter is simply a person who is required or mandated by law to report in that particular state. So all states have their own laws uh, about what constitutes child abuse in the first place. And then all states have their own laws about who, which persons are considered mandated reporters, so legally required to report uh, child abuse. And we'll talk about situations when you would need to report in, in just a bit here. And so if you did not report when you're a mandated reporter, according to the state law, it could potentially be a crime in that state. Now, in some states, every adult is considered a mandated reporter. In certain states like Texas and Florida, that's the case. Uh, in other states, it's only certain professionals who are considered mandated reporters. And typically it would be types of professionals like teachers and law enforcement, medical professionals, doctors and nurses and so forth, mental health professionals like therapists and counselors, uh, social workers. And then in many states, clergy, our pastors and priests and so forth are considered mandated reporters. But it all depends on your state. So I would encourage everyone as an individual to Google that, you know, Google your state and mandate a reporter and it'll come up. What are the laws in my state? I think that's important for us to know. I will tell you this though, Amy, in our work with churches, we work in churches all across the US and in all 50 states. And so 
when we train, we always look up the main data reporting laws before we come and train. However, we are always focused on a more important point, really, for churches and for individuals who are Christians to understand. And that is, honestly, I don't care if you're a main data reporter or not. If you have a reason to think a child is being abused, you have a much deeper moral obligation to report because that could stop abuse. It could help a child rescue a child, uh, prevent other children from being abused. So sadly, too many church leaders, uh, again, in our experience at Grace, are asking the wrong question. They're asking, do I have to report this according to the law? The more important question for them to ask is, what does Jesus require of me in this situation? What does Jesus require me to do for the sake of protecting children, for the sake of protecting vulnerable people? And really, there should just be no debate when we think about this obligation as Christians. The, the most important action for us to take as a Christian, regardless of our status as a mandated reporter, is to make that report for the sake of, of children. And so Jesus spoke vow very powerful words about the value of protecting children and our obligation in that regard. So we're going to have to answer to Jesus for that. And so mm -hmm. I would encourage every church leader, every Christian as an individual, whatever the situation is, that's the primary obligation we need to think about, not just what is my legal requirement? What's the bare minimum I have to do according to the law? I love that. I love how you're talking about, you know, really just holding ourselves as Christians to a higher standard um, of caring for the vulnerable, um, especially those in our congregation. So thank you for that. And just as a side note, you know, Grace is not a law firm. We do not offer legal advice. So just like you said, Mike, if anybody has a question about the mandatory reporting laws in their state, they should look it up. They should find someone in their state who's familiar with the laws. Um, and um, see, get that information out. So absolutely. Um, yeah, Eli, um, can you help us understand what are some concrete types of situations um, and some examples of situations where we would need to report? Sure. Um, in my field, we talk a lot about perpetrators and we talk about, you know, victims. And so when you think about the idea of a perpetrator, a big myth in that is that a perpetrator is, or an alleged perpetrator is somebody in a white van who's going around the community and doing things to children, right? Or it's somebody that you don't know or that it doesn't happen in your community. We know that perpetrators are typically somebody that that child cares for and loves for or respects, or it could be somebody that's very well known in the community. Um, and so that disclosure process, whenever a child has been victimized and they're ready to talk about their disclosure is so important. And the way that you react to that disclosure whenever it comes up um, can really have an impact on the rest of that continuing investigation. And it can have an impact on what that child is able to disclose in that time. Some concrete examples of situations in which a report needs to be made. Anytime a child discloses that abuse has occurred to them, it's important and our duty to report that. Um, if a child has disclosed any type of sexual uh, behavior in appropriate relationship, it's important to report. If a child discloses that they're being physically harmed, if you see a injury on a child, and I'm talking about injuries that are to any vital part of the body. So if you see a child has a black eye or if they're walking in and their stomach hurts and you ask to see and they have a big bruise on their stomach, it's important to report something like that. Also, if in some cases, perpetrators themselves talk about what they did to somebody else. So if an adult is telling you that they've done something inappropriate or in a sexual manner to someone else, it's important to report that as well. Um, in this day and age, we're getting a lot in the field of, with the coronavirus, a lot of kids staying home and being at home for prolonged periods of time. What are kids doing right now? They're getting on the internet. They're getting on their cell phones. They're finding new apps. We're seeing TikTok. We're seeing um, all these gaming apps. Um, 
what happens then? We get a lot of online solicitation of minors. And so it's important that any time that you're seeing any type of child pornography, if you're seeing any inappropriate conversations that an adult is having with a child, or if you're seeing any inappropriate relationship through text or video or pictures with, let's say, a religious leader or an adult in the church, it's important to report all of those instances. Um, sometimes you may even think that the child is having a conversation with another child on the internet, but we know that could be an adult that's talking on the other side of the screen. So it's important really to not just assume that it's another child they may be talking to and report it as well. Also, um, we see a lot of juvenile perps as well. And so sometimes it happens that an adult, they may be at a family event or they may be at a meeting or maybe even in the church and an adult walks in on some suspicious activity happening with two juveniles. It's also very important to report those kinds of situations because there are criminal proceedings for juveniles. Um, anyone over the age of 10 can be charged uh, with any type of sexual um, uh, offense. And so it's important not only because you're trying to charge someone with something, but for the juveniles, it's important for them to go, to go through the system of being able to help get the help that they need so that as adults, they don't continue to um, have offenses, offenses against other people as well. And if I could just jump in there, Amy, yeah, and add a couple ahead, of things. Yeah. One is, and that's the law that Eli mentioned in Texas, uh, age 10, Correct. but in other states, it, that could vary as well. So that's important. another important note to be aware of your state laws in that regard. At the same time, a lot of us haven't had deeper training and aren't a forensic interviewer like Eli to be an expert in signs uh, and indicators of abuse. So just a couple of resources that would be really helpful for either individuals and certainly for uh, church leaders. Uh, one is our uh, child safeguarding policy guide, and you can find that on our website. Uh, there's a thorough discussion in our book about signs and indicators of abuse of different in different forms. You know what types of it's normal for little children to run around and fall and have some bruises on their shins and things like that. But like Eli mentioned, there's other areas of the body where the injuries strongly indicate abuse and that would need to be reported. And then for sexual abuse and other forms of abuse there are common indicators. And there's a thorough discussion in our book. So that's the Child Safeguarding Policy Guide uh, by Basile Chavidjian and Shira Berkovitz. There's also a free resource on childwelfare.gov. If people Google uh, child abuse signs and symptoms, uh, childwelfare.gov has a really great, very straightforward, simple PDF. And then one further resource is an article by Victor Vieth, who's on our board, and it's a discussion of normal sexual development for children. So when children are demonstrating certain behaviors sexually as they develop, some of those behaviors are just normal development. And then there are behaviors that are abnormal. And so that article, Victor does a good job of summarizing what are the things that would indicate this is not normal and perhaps a report would need to be made. So we'll put that article and make that available to everyone, link to it. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Those resources are really helpful. And we'll talk a little bit more about those at the end too. Um, Mike, let's, you know, so we have a situation, let's say hypothetically, we have a situation, we've talked about disclosures, Eli, so we've talked about what a mandated reporter is. Let's say it comes to the point where someone's, yes, we definitely need to report this. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process and what that looks like? Sure. So a couple of things. One is uh, very simply, uh, if the situation is happening if there is violence underway or has just happened, the easy thing to do is simply call 911. And that's typically the best course of action. Now, if that's not the case, if it's not that immediate, uh, but there, a report needs to be made, what we would typically want is someone to call the local police or the local child protective services. Now, this will again vary depending on which state you, you reside. And different states, some have kind of a hotline for the entire state, that's the intake, and you call that first. And now in some, some states, that they do the intake through that number, or through that number, they direct you to the local uh, appropriate person. So 
that's where I would just say Google reporting child abuse in your state. That information will typically come up. And so that's, that's the first thing. That's a couple of, of distinctions to make. Uh, sometimes it does vary who you call first, the police or CPS, depending on the alleged perpetrator. Often if it's a caregiver, you know, a caregiver, uh, more specifically, if you have that knowledge, uh, often in certain states you would report to Child Protective Services first. So if it was a caregiver like a parent or a babysitter, a teacher, a coach, a pastor. Again, that can vary by state. So you just, again, Google that in your state and learn a little bit about, and it's not complicated, and here's the thing, if you call the police and you should have called CPS first, that's okay. <laughs> they can hopefully direct you uh, if, if they say, well, you need to call CPS first, or if you call CPS and say, no, you need to call law enforcement first. Again, don't get discouraged, just continue to follow through and reach out to the other entity. And then simply what you're doing when you call is you're reporting basic things, who, what, uh, when, if you know, uh, things like that, where, if you know, and here, here's what I find in churches often, or individuals ask this question. I'm so nervous about reporting because what if, what if I'm not, what if it's not true, or what if this, or what if that? Here's, a, I think, an important way to think about reporting. When you report, you are not asking someone to go arrest someone. You're not saying, I've caught an abuser. When you report child abuse, you're simply giving information that is potentially vital to the protecting of that child and other children to professionals who have training to know how to take that information and respond appropriately. And it could be a variety of different responses. So again, you are not personally accusing someone when you have a disclosure, whether it's from a child or another adult mentions that abuse, they think abuse happened or someone opens up about something they did to a child, you're not saying, I've caught an abuser, go arrest them. That's not how it works. You're simply giving information that's potentially vital to the protecting of vulnerable people, to professionals who have training, deeper training to know how to respond uh, in a variety of different ways. Thank you, Mike. And Eli, I know, you know, we talked a little bit earlier this week about kind of your experience and what happens on the backside once a report is made. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And I also, as you're talking about that, um, I know we talked a little bit about, and Mike just mentioned this issue of a false claim or a false report. We talked a little bit about disclosures and we get this a lot, you know, well, I'm just not sure I should report because maybe it's just an angry 15 year old who's having a dispute with her, with, you know, his or her father. Um, I've heard that before. So can you talk a little bit about that and what happens, you know, when a report is made? Sure. Um, I think first and foremost, you have to really think um, as a situation is happening, of course, and a child is disclosing something to you. I think as human beings and as caring people, we want to help that child in any way that we can. And we want to be able to gather all that information in the very beginning. So we're that person that helps that child, right? But I think as adults, we really have to take a step back from that and understand that there is a process to this and that there are going to be people that this child is going to be talking to. And it really affects the way that a child discloses if they've already talked about their abuse. Um, as an advocacy center itself, um, at the Children's Advocacy Center of Cullen County, the organization is created to lessen the trauma that a child has to experience by having to retell their account of their abuse. So what do we want to do? We want to minimize the a number of times that that child has to relive that traumatic experience because you don't know how that child is going to react when they're getting into those nitty gritty details about what actually happened. There's so much trauma that encompasses everything that goes on that that child may have issues in that moment telling you something. They may have mental health issues in that moment. And so you really want the professional to be able to deal with those situations as they're happening. 
Another thing that greatly impacts is that sometimes I've seen specifically in the church system that um, they either get the perpetrator and the child to sit together and they have a conversation about what's happened. And that's extremely traumatic for a child to have to go through. And not only that, they also feel like um, sometimes whenever that happens, that now they can put it away. And now I don't have to talk about it again. Now I don't have to tell another person. God has forgiven everything that has happened. And now I'm ready to just move on from it. When that child gets to the advocacy center and that beginning point of that investigation begins and that child is sitting in the forensic interview and I ask, I want you to tell me everything that happened from the very beginning until the very end. I've had children tell me, I've already talked about this and I don't want to talk about it anymore. I've had children tell me we've already prayed about it and I've learned to forgive and I don't really see a need to talk about it anymore. That child really believes that everything is done and dealt with. And that really puts us in a hard place because in order to be able to help that child, we have to understand the abuse and there's dynamics of um, different laws in every state that we have to hit in order for law enforcement to go out, get search warrants, corroborate information in order for even that child to get therapeutic services that are free of charge at our center, the child has to be able to describe some type of abuse that happened to them. And if at this point, when they get to our center, the child is not ready to talk about it anymore, doesn't want to talk about it anymore, that greatly impacts that child's life moving forward and the services that that child can get in order to become a more healthier version of themselves, right? And to get the help that not only that child needs, but that their entire family needs. Because as we know, abuse not only impacts that victim, but it also impacts the entire family unit and people around them as well. So it's really important to not lead that child. There's been instances in which a child discloses something to an adult because the adult has asked the question in the wrong way, right? Because they're not trained to ask these specific questions or these um, questions in a manner that's not leading. Um, and so a lot of the times defense attorneys, whenever it goes to trial later on and they're in the court system, they'll get up and against the kid and they're not lenient with the children on the stand, these defense attorneys. And they'll tell them you were inconsistent. You told the religious leader at the church one thing. And then when you came in for the forensic interview, you said something completely different. But as we know, the, the children aren't being inconsistent. There, it may have been a memory that may have been triggered later on that they remembered something else or they, um, as they're going through it, they might remember a specific detail they left out. Um, so it's really important to not intervene in those situations in the way of interrogating a child or asking too many questions because it can ultimately impact um, the forensic interview and the services they're on after. Mm -hmm. So what I hear you saying, Eli, is that churches should not investigate themselves they shouldn't confront the alleged offender. They shouldn't put the um, alleged offender and the uh, you know reported victim in the same room. And you know, and Christian circles, you were applying a Matthew 18 principle. What I hear you saying is that those things should absolutely should not be done, and that it should be reported, and that the trained professionals should should handle it. Correct. Okay. It's just so it's so helpful to hear your perspective, having been on the other side, having been a forensic interviewer. I think you said when we talked um, earlier this week that you've done over 1,200 interviews, yes. and it's just it's amazing to me just hearing your perspective on this and how um, you know how that how we as we as humans and people when they report when it's done right, it can how it can be really helpful to the to the victim. And when it's not done right, how it can be really harmful to the victim and to the, to the investigation. So For sure. And then you also mentioned about the fear, and I heard Mike talk about this earlier, about the fear of, you know, um, having an allegation out there that might not be true. And so a lot of the times in the forensic interview, the children don't know what we're going to be asking them, and neither do the parents. And so whenever we go into the actual interview room ourselves, we're not introducing information to that child. So we're not letting them know, okay, this is what we heard and this is what you've told people, tell me all about that. Mm -hmm. We're eliciting information from a child in a very open-ended way. Um, we're gathering whatever that child is telling us and then this is where we get into the art form of forensic interview right? We're gathering tidbits that that child is giving you, and we're going off based off of that. 
And so we're asking follow-up questions based off of information that that child has already given us. So this forensic interview setting is not like an interrogation. It's not me giving the facts already. It's very child-centered and it's very, um, we're going at the pace that that child needs to be met at, right? So we're adjusting to whatever they may need in that moment and whatever information they, be, they may be giving us compared to an adult who may sit down a child and say something like, so-and-so did this to you, didn't they? Or is this the person that did it to you? Have you been touched in your female sexual organ? Things like that are so different and can change the dynamic of what a child says. Mm -hmm. Eli, in, in my experience with churches, and we get this a lot, is a lot of them are concerned about and have kind of a misconception that false allegations from children are very common. And we teach them from the research, actual research, it, rigorous studies confirm over and over again, actual percentages of false reports from children are, are very low. In your experience though, uh, what is your experience with that? As a forensic interviewer, what's your personal experience with false reports and how common they are? False reports are not very common in my experience and the way, just the way that the, um, the forensic interview comes set in place, right? Because you make a report and then that report trickles down to family protective services or law enforcement. Then at that point, they're going to be able to ask follow-up questions. They're gonna gather more information and then they're gonna assess whether it meets the criteria for a forensic interview. So we also have at our advocacy center what's called a multiplinary enhancement program. So the multiplinary enhancement program, what their sole role is to be able to connect law enforcement and CPS in order to make sure that a child who needs a forensic interview is receiving that forensic interview. So they have to go through that screening process in itself. Um, so by the point that a child comes in for a forensic interview, it's because there's reason to believe that something has happened or there's enough for law enforcement or CPS to be able to identify that this child really needs to be talked to by a professional. Um, so it's not every report that gets called in that receives a forensic interview. So in my experience, the amount of actual um, false allegations that have occurred in my personal experience, I've only had one child actually come back and say that what they described in the interview room was not actually true and that they had made it up. So you're saying you've done 1,200 interviews and of the 1,200, you've had one situation where it was essentially the child you know, said it didn't happen is what I'm hearing you say. Yes, and, and even if a child were to say, hey, what I said is not true, we would still conduct another forensic interview to make sure that we're gathering all the details of what happened in that situation. So we're, we would treat it equally um, as any other forensic interview as well. Thank you, Eli. Um, well, we are just closing in on our time, but I do wanna ask just a couple more questions and we may go a little bit over 1.30. Um, but one thing that is so important to Grace and to the work that we do is survivor care. And so, Mike, I just wanted to ask you, and Eli, I'd love to hear your perspective on this too. It's just um, once a report is made, uh, Mike, what can churches do at that point to care for survivors and for the family? Um, and Eli, I'd love to hear your perspective on this too, um, because one thing we've heard at Grace a lot, I mean, I've heard a lot um, of stories where survivors, their case has gone to court and they've been the only, they've been on, on their side, people who've come to support them in court, it's victims. It's been them and maybe someone from the CAC or someone, a, one family member. And then on the alleged offenders or the, you know, the perpetrator side, there's been the entire, a lot of church leaders, a lot of the church that are coming to support the perpetrator and just how hurtful that was. So any insight you both have on how um, once a report is made, how the church can care for survivors and care for the family um, as they're going through this entire process. Right. So for church, for church leaders and just anyone in a church who is thinking about caring for a survivor, first of all, we want to make sure that we recognize our own limits. And so we've talked a lot about 
uh, child advocacy centers and the trauma-informed care for children they can receive there. So to recommend and encourage families to get plugged into that type of care is critical. And yet, of course, as a, a Christian community, there are other things that we can do, respecting the roles of other professionals, and for just sitting with any survivor, some of the key things we always advise is just sitting in the hard emotions of what happened and allowing to just validate the person and their worth and the, all the emotions that come, the anger, the betrayal, the confusion, to say that all that's normal and just to lament with them. That's a very biblical thing to think about lamenting. And there's so many Psalms on that. Uh, to just weep with those who weep is very basic, human, and something God calls us to do. Not to try to fix them, give them a theology lesson, give them spiritual platitudes. That's not helpful. But just on a personal level, validate them, normalize what they're experiencing. And everyone's different. So to not try to push them to fit into a certain mold and say, this is what you need now, listen to them, <laughs> give them space to speak and respect their privacy, respect their agency. And that's really the best things you can be doing, be present, but if they need space, give them space. So treat them as an individual, treat them with respect, know your limits, refer them to trauma-informed care wherever possible. Churches can do a lot often to step up and facilitate that if, if the cost is an issue. Uh, that's another thing to consider. So those are just a few things practically I would tell uh, Christians and church leaders when they think about caring for survivors. No, I totally agree with Mike on that. I think that one of the major things after disclosure has been made is that that child needs support. And a lot of the times um, children are scared or don't want to report because of the fear of not being supported or not being believed. And so what are we really demonstrating if there is no support afterward? Um, that really closes down a child from being able to talk about what they've experienced and not only if it were to happen again, um, because a lot of the times you see that a child who has been victimized can be victimized again um, by a different person or even by the same person. And so that really, you're really setting the boundary and you're really showing that child and demonstrating positivity and support, which can be so important. And Amy, I don't know how many, because I'm also an export, expert in testimony. And so I don't know how many times I've sat in the, um, court waiting room where I usually testify um, before the child does and the child comes right up to the room and they're crying and they're scared and they're nervous and they feel like there's nobody there to back them up and you walk into the courtroom like you mentioned and everyone's on the perpetrator side and everybody's sitting there. What does that show that child? I was brave enough to disclose something. I was brave enough to talk about what happened to me and now there's nobody there to support me. So I feel like the greatest tip we can give is to be able to be encouraging um, as a church community or um, be able to be there for that child and, you know, rally for them and be able to be there anything that they may need. Because as Mike said, what they need might be a little different and they might show it a little bit different, but whatever it is, step up and be able to do that for that child. That gave me chills when you were talking about that, just that, you know, the support that we can give survivors and really is so important um, that they have that support and it really can be the, the thing that can really impact them the most, especially if the church is, is the one that's coming alongside them and saying, we stand by you and we're here with you. And we, you know, walking alongside, like Mike said, it's a walking alongside a survivor. It's not a pushing them or pulling them or it's just the walking alongside and just the great impact that that could have on a victim. Um, so thank you both so much for coming. Um, I know Mike, you had a couple of things you wanted to wrap up or just last finishing touches, you know, finishing comments before we go. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Sure. So just a couple of thoughts as we wrap up this time. Uh, one is for those who are listening, whether you're a survivor or not, when we talk about things like abuse, it is something that we have to make sure that we make space to care for ourselves in the wake of difficult conversation. And so I would just highly recommend you take time. If you've been with us this afternoon, thanks for, for joining us. 
but make some time this afternoon to do some deliberate self-care. So take a walk, listen to some music that's relaxing. However you, uh, whatever you do to care for yourself, to recharge, to relax, uh, that's very, very important. And particularly if you uh, have trauma in your background. And then the second thing I would end with, Amy, is to just end with a challenge for church leaders. Look at your policies. Are you the champion of your policy in your church community? And what does that policy say about reporting abuse for, for children? Does it say, we report child abuse in our community? And here, here are mandated reporting laws in our state. But beyond that, we have a strong moral obligation to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and to speak for the vulnerable uh, and, and report abuse. And so we encourage all members, whether or not you work directly with children, to report child abuse. Uh, that is our church's policy. Does your policy say that? So take a look. You know, I mentioned our child safeguarding policy guide get some good resources, reach out to us, have us help you look at your policies and really set the pace as a leader, as a community. Say, as a community, we are going to care for the vulnerable. We're gonna do all we can to protect the vulnerable. And that includes, we're gonna have, for child abuse, we're gonna have a no, <laughs> we're not gonna have a confusing policy. The policy is we report child abuse, period. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Eli, for joining us. We just appreciate you so much for um, spending your Saturday afternoon with us here at Grace. And um, thank you, Mike, as well. And um, well, there were some resources that were mentioned today. At a later time, we're going to link in our, on our Facebook page um, the links to those resources. And then also you can check out our resources on our Grace website. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and we hope you have a great Saturday afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.